Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. I love that about the Lord. There's still so many things that He has in our future that we don't even yet know about. And so even if it was just for that, it would be worthwhile hanging on to the future to, and not giving up now when everything looks uh, a little bit bleak and terrible, uh, especially, you know, this year. So praise the Lord. Today, I just want to bring a kind of a conclusion to the last couple of weeks when we've been talking about dealing with the challenges of life, the storms of life. And I want to talk this morning about reacting to uh, the storms of life. And a lot of people would say, well, do you know what? Um, you shouldn't be reacting to anything. You should already be proactive and you should know what's going to happen. Well, I'm glad they can do that, but I've been caught on the hop so many times when I have had to react to situations. Can anyone here agree, uh, identify with that? We've all have to react to things because sometimes we don't know what's coming We don't know what's coming. The Word actually confirms that. And we have to be ready to react to certain things. So um, as much as I'd I'd like to be prepared and and have a, a strategy and a plan for absolutely everything, sometimes I just have to be ready to react and hope it's the right way, amen, and that it's a godly way, amen. And so because we all probably all react to situations in different ways, Um, But I think we should study the life of Jesus and how he reacted to difficult times and storms and study the other men of men of the word, Paul and 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 David and and the and the generals of the faith and see how they reacted to things and we can glean a lot from them, amen. And then we can strive to emulate them as well. Amen. So I thank thank God for the examples in our lives, the mentors. And those that we we look to and that we learn from, um, without them, a lot of us would be really not in. We would not be as advanced as we are now. Amen. We still need those people. We need the Word and the Spirit. Holy Spirit will show us the way. He will show us the way. But we need those people around us. We really do. Amen. So, amen. So, I want to just look at one of the ways that Jesus actually reacted to most things. Jesus, um, the first thing he did was, from wherever he was, he would rise up or he would arise, all right? Then he would rebuke and then he would speak into the situation, amen? And in Mark 4, 38, you can see that he was in the boat and he was sleeping, but he arose from that and he took instantaneous authority over the storm. In an instant, he took authority. And a lot of times, I personally, I wait, I think I'll wait until this this passes. Instead of taking instantaneous authority over the situation, I think, well, I'll maybe just try and take cover until this goes overhead. Do you know what I mean? And and sometimes it's best not to take cover. It's best to, to instantly rebuke the storm. Amen. Because I can also, and you can also arise, rebuke, and speak to the situation. You can do that. Amen. And uh, arise means to rise up. It also means to originate from somewhere. So you were somewhere and you're going to some place. You're rising up. Amen. To arise means to come into being, all right? You're not, we did this series called Anonymous a while ago. You know, you're not, we're not obscure people. You can come into view. You can come into being. You can step into activity. Arise means to step into activity. And as I just said, to come into view or to appear, amen? And also when you arise, you're able to view. Because when you rise up, you're able to see things from a different vantage point. You rise up. 
Amen. You don't stay lying down or seated. Amen. You know, and if you, if I was to take the decision to sit down through my battles or lie down, the, the reality is I would probably be overcome. Amen. I, I can't sit down during my battles and expect change to happen. I have to rise up. I have to rise up because there's no future unless we step into activity. We've got to keep on walking into activity. And in Genesis 13, 17, you can see there that what did God instruct Abram to do? He said in Genesis 13, 17, arise and walk in the land through the length and the, the width of the land, for I am giving it to you. So we all know, we've heard that we've had, probably had the sermon hundreds of times, you know, if he had stayed in his tent, he would never have seen the multitude of stars that God said, your descendants after you will be like these stars. He had to, he had to rise up and get outside and bring all of this into view. Amen. So what about if we're thinking about someone else, opposite side of the spectrum, the prodigal son, all right, who even, you know the story, but even after total loss, and he was completely destitute, he was eaten with the pigs, all right, by doing one thing, he turned the whole situation around. By doing one thing. And what did he do? He, in Luke 15, verse 18, says, I will arise and I will go to my father. I like to say that I will arise and I'm going to go back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy. Verse 20 says, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. I can imagine this, this man rising up and going back to his father and, and he comes back into view. He comes back into his father's sight he had been gone. He had disappeared from his father's vision. But because he rose up, I can almost, I, I always get the picture of this, of these green hills and this man coming over the horizon and the father, he's out there, he's sitting on his, on his patio and, and he's looking, he's, he's, he knows his son is going to come back. But this young man, he comes back into the view of his father. And maybe there's some of us that we should come back into the view of our Heavenly Father. Get back in His line of sight again. Rise up to come back into His vision. I'm not saying that He doesn't, He never, He doesn't forget us. But He says, if He said to Abram, arise, if it's good enough for Abram, it's good enough for me as well. Amen. And the other thing about rising up is if you stay in a particular place for too long, or in a particular situation, it can get, um, can get smelly there, nasty, and, and, and old and stale. And in Micah chapter 2, verse 10, um, it says there, Arise and depart, for this is not where you will rest. This is not your rest, because it is defiled. It shall destroy you with utter destruction. Amen? So there's a lot of good reasons for us to rise up. And so um, I just love Jesus when normally when he gave an instruction to someone, the, one of the things he would say is arise, arise up, amen. And, re, and, and so we, all, we have these choices or reactions that we can have towards what's going on, the, 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 the storms or the challenges or the situations. And I find that they always produce exactly what's inside of you. Your reaction is a mirror image of what's going on in your heart. Amen. So if I react to something, I've got a choice. Do I curse or do I bless? You know, you know, if, you know, I've got to make a choice. You know, if like doing DIY together is being testing my, our patience with one another. 
<laughs> to me, to you, to me, to you, to me, to you. And, um, but, you know, we got to choose between curse, you know, to cursing and blessing. And we've got it. So when people step on your toes or give you a hard time, we're faced with a reaction, do we curse or do we bless? Do we curse or do we bless? So I was looking at um, uh, some elements of the word reaction and what it means to be reactionary. And one that really stood out to me is one definition of reaction is a force exerted in opposition to an applied force. So you can imagine a force coming against you, all right? There's pressure, an, ap an application of force against you. And our reaction can either be to meet that force with force or to try and somehow deal with it or, or it will just flatten us. So you've got, you either go forward Stay still, brace yourself, or you get run over when a force comes. Amen? And I thought about that, and I thought how many times when Satan would try and come against you, we do not meet that force with a great, the greater force that we have within us. And we have that force in us. We have what they call the, the force of faith. We have the force of faith and the authority in the name of Jesus. So when a force comes against us, we've got the ability to meet that force with not only the same force, but with greater force. Amen. 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 And so another one is re reactions are a mode of behavior or thinking that are deliberately different from previous modes of thoughts and behavior. And I want to say this morning that I think it's possible to react in a new way to old habits and challenges. It's possible to react in a new way. Because I've heard this saying, oh, I always react this way. It's just my personality. <laughs> you know, the, you know, Eleanor was saying she's the P in personality, and I says, well, maybe you're the Y in personality. <laughs> but we've all got personalities, and we say, why? Why am I? But we can change, and we can react differently to things that are coming against us, especially things that are repetitive. Amen? And our re reactions can be either negative or positive. Hallelujah. So I want this morning, just for a little short while, to look at some common reactions to stormy situations and battles and trials in our lives. Amen. And you just have to look around you and you'll see these reactions everywhere. And we still have these reactions, which is why, why um, you know, we're striving towards perfecting the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Amen? So I want to start with one of the common ones you see in, 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 a, in a test, and it's anger. Anger. People get angry. How come I'm in the middle of this storm? You know? And you're not only angry at, at yourself sometimes, but you're angry at everybody around you as well. They all bear the brunt of your anger as well. And we can get angry with our bosses, angry with, you know, those that we work with, angry with our, our brothers and sisters. We can get irritated, you know. We can get angry with life. We can get angry with God. Amen. And we say, well, they caused my problem. And so I want to put a question to you this morning, is anger the right reaction in a storm? Is anger the right reaction? Probably not. Probably not. And Scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9, it says, do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these for you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Amen? How many times have we heard that? Oh, you know, 
the good old days. You know, the good old, I wish it could all just be like that. Do you know, sometimes one of the biggest problems in life is nostalgia. I love being nostalgic, but if I get stuck in nostalgia, then, you know, it really it takes me back to habits that I had years ago. That's where nostalgia can lead you back into a lifestyle that you once lived. So I, can, I want to uh, enjoy the memories but not repeat the life cycle of that. Amen. So, you know, and sometimes we question the Lord. We say, you know, well, why, why was last year better than this year? You know, we had a great year in 2008, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes we do that and we've got this heart attitude of frustration. We're exasperated. And, you know, we're just downright ticked off about the whole thing, you know. But anger is... Anger is, 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 is really something that rises up inside us. It it's, can be a work of the flesh, anger. And it has a time span which should never be exceeded. Does anyone know what the time span of anger is? It only, it's only supposed to last until you go to sleep. That's, it, that's the time span. That's it. After, after you go to sleep, it's supposed to go... <laughs> <laughs> go away. So, you know, when you get the nudge in the morning, you know, and you, you, wake, grump, you wake up grumpy, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you, there's something still lingering from the day before. Anger's supposed to have a time span where it's, it's gone. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath while you're still angry. Why were we not supposed to let the sun go down on our wrath? Because the verse goes on to say, if you do, you give the devil a foothold. You give him a foothold. Yeah. Amen. So, does the word say we'll never be angry? No. no. But the anger that leads us to sin is a big problem. The word doesn't say we'll never be angry. It's anger that leads to sin is a problem. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Proverbs 21, 24 in the NIV says, the proud and arrogant person, mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. So that shows me something there, that anger is rooted somehow in someone with a proud heart or pride. Anger rooted in pride. And I can tell you, one of the one of the traits of, of pride is to resist change, is to resist change. This is the way I am, and this is the way I, you take me as you find me, and this is the way I, I am. So if anger is rooted in pride, we're going to stay angry for a very long time, a long, long time. And I think you get, you know, you get those people, you hear uh, you know, okay, Victor Meldrew was probably actually quite, quite, you know, tame, you know, but there's people that get a lot more angry than that and stay angry for a long time. Amen. So growing angry and staying that way when storms come and challenges come is not wise. And the likelihood is that in that anger will make all the wrong choices and all the wrong decisions. So we've got to watch for that. James chapter 1 verse 20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God wants to see in us. Amen. And so we, 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 we have this, we have to deal with this anger and one of the worst reactions you can have is the desire to see someone else punished for the, the inconvenience you've just suffered. You know, this has been, oh, you know, how dare you? You know, that's really put me out of my step for today. And you unleash this anger and fury on people in situations. And it's not right. How did Jesus handle, handle anger? Well, I know one thing, he was quick to forgive and forgiveness quenches anger. Grace quenches anger. 
Forbearance quenches anger. Amen. And I think, you know what? Jesus was so good at handling anger. You know, if Christ died to make the enemies of God the friends of God, right, which he did, amen, and you read that in Romans 5.10, then, do you know what? He had to get, get the victory over his anger because the, he, was, he, he came to make God's enemies God's friends. So you can't keep people your enemies forever. Do you know what I mean? So praise God. Romans 5.10 says, For if we, when we were enemies of God, were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. So we were considered, you know, unbelievers, you know, heathens, enemies of God. We might not even have known God, but we certainly didn't want anything to do with his ways. And... Um, Jesus died so that we could be re reconciled to God and have much more abundant life because of that. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 verse 21 tells us not to be angry with our brothers without a cause. And I really like that one because it showed me that sometimes there is a cause that we can become angry about. But I always like to say this, uh, we have to sanctify our anger. We have to sanctify it. We have to channel it. Use it, to, use it to rise up, but don't let it corrupt you. Amen? In John eleven thirty three, 33, Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, and one translation says that a deep anger welled up within him. But that spiritual, ang that spiritual anger that welled up within him produced a supernatural result because Lazarus, came back to life. Can you imagine that the anger welling up in Jesus, his, someone who he loved so much, his life had been cut short, and he just channeled that, and he's back to life. Amen? So Jesus got angry in his spirit. When he seen people, the pain of people and the suffering of people, he grew angry in his spirit. Amen? He got troubled by that, but he always, he always, he never let it dominate him. Amen? Another reaction that we have is blaming other people. Okay, I'm putting my hand up to that. Blaming other people, you know, and also blames rooted in pride because we want to deflect any accountability or responsibility away from ourselves. So we blame other people. You know, I can't be wrong. I can't, you know, we can't admit our weaknesses. And I think we, it seems to come naturally to us to do that, even from when we were small. He did it. He did it. Who did this? He did it. You know, it just seems such a natural thing. You know, someone else is the cause of my misfortune. Someone else it's the cause of me ending up in this storm. It's all a negative reaction. And in, in Job, in chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Evil does not spring from the soil, and trouble does not sprout from the earth. People are born for trouble as readily as sparks come up from a fire. So, you know, if man is born and will experience some trouble, then Linda's not the source of my problem. And I'm not the source of your problem, sweetheart. And my kids are not the source of my problem. And, you know, so we've got to understand that, that that's the situation. We're all accountable to God. And we all have to, God says, God will one day say to us, what did you do with what I gave you? And we can't say, you know, and even I can't get into you know, I can't, I can't live my faith out on the coattails of my dad or my mom. It's down to me. You know, I can't hitch a ride. I can't uh, not hit, I can't backy a ride into heaven 
on someone else's faith, we have to take that personal responsibility ourselves and not get involved in the blame game. You know, well, it was, he, she tempted me. And that's why I did that, because I was seduced into that. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let it have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You know, what did Jesus do with the biggest temptations of his life? And this is probably the number one weapon against the circumstances that come against us. Well, we'll find it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, the devil, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. There we emulate Jesus. Satan, away, away with you. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because it is written. And then go to the word and speak the word. Arise, rebuke, speak. Arise, rebuke, speak. Amen. Another one reaction we have is, woe is me, or why me? Why me? In Job, 14, chap in Job chapter 14, verse 1, there's something similar to one we just read. How frail is humanity? How short is life and how full of trouble is it? You know, if, we, if I say, you know, why me, why me, why me all the time, really what I'm saying is, why don't you pick on someone else instead, Lord? You know, why, don't, why, don't, why doesn't someone else get this trial? Why doesn't someone else have to go through this storm? But it's my, it was for my perfecting. Amen? So sometimes, if that's the case, we don't understand God then. Amen? God never promised us a trouble-free life. He only promised us a triumphant life. So the, tr the, the troubles are there, but you're, you, you, you have the promise that you will triumph, that you, that you can triumph. You have the victor. You're on the victor's side. Amen? So what is the definition of someone that's triumphant? The definition of someone that's triumphant is someone that has overcome trouble. So it's overcomers. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going well. Discouragement is the next reaction. Discouragement means that your courage has disappeared or vanished. <laughs> I had courage, but all of a sudden it's gone. You know, have you ever felt those are moments where, you know, I've been confronted, especially I remember at, at, at school, you know, Sometimes you get into playground fights and stuff. And you know, you know the geely legs. That's, that's where courage leaves you. It definitely goes out through your, through your feet. <laughs> You're standing there. Uh, and I remember one big boy. He, uh, it, was pre it was arranged 2 p.m. at the park. <laughs> and he was a big boy. And I went and skirted around the park for about 20 minutes. And he didn't turn up. Um, but my legs were already like jelly. But I, t I claimed the victory because he didn't come. He didn't come. <laughs> praise, the Lord, praise the Lord. But when we become discouraged, it's hard to face the future with confidence. And God wants, he wants us to have the confidence of knowing him. Amen. And so it means that, you know, we have confidence. And discouragement is one of the things where it leads to us giving up. You know, we get discouraged and we're going, right, no, I'm going to give up. And the thing is about dis discouragement is this, you know, courage works together with strength to get the job done. And if one is not present, if I have courage but no strength, or I have strength but no courage, then I can't achieve what I need to achieve. So 
If one is absent, the other is ineffective. Amen? So we need them working together. And if you want to, for some homework, you can read Joshua 1 from verse 6 to 9, where it says, where God says, be strong and courageous. Amen? You'll let you read that one yourself. But God issues a command here saying, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Amen? Another good um, uh, scripture to go to for that is Isaiah 35, verses 3 to 4. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees and say to those who are fearful in their hearts, be strong, do not fear, because your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Amen? And, you know, many times when I look within, I discourage myself. I don't need much discouragement from other people. I'm pretty good at discouraging. <laughs> I do a good job of it myself. I look within, mm, no, it's not going to be a good day. <laughs> you know? And, but then other times we look outside of ourselves and we get discouraged when we look around us, don't we? But there's one place we can look, not within, not around, but up. We lift our eyes. And then we see encouragement when we lift our eyes up. Amen? Because God gives courage. You know, it's almost like, I always think of the Wizard of Oz. The, the, you know, I always think of that when I think of that. It's like, where's my courage? Well, he thought, well, I just need this and that will fix it. But there's an innate strength in you. That's why the word says, take it. Take courage. Take it. Amen? Hallelujah. And the reason why we need to stay encouraged is because we need to encourage the discouraged that are around us. And that, that is everywhere. Yeah. Moving on quickly, another reaction is bitterness. Amen? After, usually bitterness comes after discouragement. And you begin to resent the circumstances that you're in. Amen? And you get, you get very bitter about it and not better. You know, I'm thinking about Marlene in the hospital for all those weeks, and we thought, You're only, you'll be in and out. And then there you were in the hospital for all that time, and you could have, been, you could have got bitter, but you got better. You, you held on to your faith in there, and you stayed strong and encouraged, and you left. You didn't let bitterness get in there, bitter, resenting why. Why has it all gone so wrong? You stayed, you stayed there, amen. And, you know, in, in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, when the disciples went to Jesus sleeping in the boat, they wake him up. What sort of reaction did they think that Jesus was going to have, you know? But when they woke him up, they woke him up. I can imagine they were a bit aggrieved. Why are you sleeping? What, that, you know, they were, they, were getting, they were getting agitated. Why are you sleeping? Amen. So sometimes we expect a certain reaction. Sometimes we expect a certain reaction and the reality is far dif different from that. Amen. So, but uh, concerning bitterness in 12, Hebrews 12, verse 15, it says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Look carefully lest you should fall short of God's grace lest any root of bitterness should spring up and cause trouble because you're defiled by the root of bitterness. And I love the way it's described as a root because a root is always the start of something. The root is the origin of something, amen? And so something's always going to grow out of the root. So bitterness usually always grows, all right? Always grows. And leaving hurts. How many, I don't know how many people I speak to that have unresolved hurts from the past. They have, they have big issue, life issues and wounds from the past. And if I know how, listen, I know how difficult that is. I truly do to know what it is like to carry that, those kind of wounds. But leaving them unresolved in your spirit leads to a lot of, of baggage that you don't need to be carrying around. And it's, it, I think it makes us sour. Do you know sour? Or do, doer, is doer the same as sour? Maybe it is. 
in, in sour in, in our character. In James 3.14, it says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Bitterness is an issue of the heart and it will eventually show up on our faces. So whatever that root of bitterness, before long, it's going to be plain for everyone to see. We might end on, on this one or the next one. Disillusionment. Disillusionment. That's when you realize that your expectations don't match your reality. Well, that's not what I expected to find. You know, when I went along to that, to the Bridge Church, that's not why I hope no one's disillusioned when they come here. But we, you know, I, I always, this, I know this well, disappointments are not based on what you find, but on what you expect to find. And disillusionment is the self. It doesn't match up. And you, if we, you look at Elijah, Elijah takes on these, I think there was 850 prophets or priests of Baal and Asherah together. Here we go, we're putting the sacrifices there. And these, the, 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 this deity of theirs, Baal, he was supposed to be able to control the rain. Of course, Elijah meets that force with an even greater force. So they come with all of their force and their dancing and their, their, their ritual and everything else. And, and Elijah says, well, you might think you serve the God of rain, but I serve a God who controls the weather. This will be a drought, you, you know, or this, there'll be rain when there needs to be rain or no rain. When you want it, there'll be no rain. So, amen. But right after that, a lady called Jezebel shows up on the scene and threatens to kill Elijah. And what does Elijah do after that great victory? He runs for his life. He runs for his life. He runs away. One threat, and he runs totally disillusioned. Well, I've just, you know, here I've just had this great victory, and now I'm running. You know, I think sometimes uh, we try and run. I know this year I'm like, Father God, just give me a rock big enough to get under, or a cave that I can go in. It has to be a bit bigger, mind you, because I've put on a wee bit of weight through lockdown, so, so that no one can find me, so that nobody can find me going to find the rock and stay under it, you know. But the, the Word of God says, Psalm 139, no matter where you flee to, I'm there. I'm there. Where can I flee from your presence, Lord, you know? And you, when you come to think about it, God, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, li listen, I'm going to buy me a big bush knife. I'm going to go into the, I'm going to go somewhere into the, the wilderness I'm going to make a bivy, live off the land, and I'm not going to have any hassle at all. I'm disillusioned with life. You know, before long, someone's going to come along, and you're going to, where did you come from? Oh, right, mate, got any 4G signal here? You know, you know, got any, you know, it's just people come, you know, you cannot, sometimes you just cannot escape. You cannot escape, you know. And so, where can we flee from his presence? So, you know, we can even be going about God's business just like Elijah did. We can be prayed up and confident that God is working in the situation and all of a sudden someone comes along and says something that causes us to be plunged into a struggle, into a battle, into, it causes us to plunge, be plunged into a fearful situation. And at times like that, you can ask, is it worth it? Is it worth staying true to this faith thing? Is, it, is this Christianity worth it? Well, I want to tell you it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it because you, you will endure that stuff. You will endure it and you will come out of it and you will not be downcast and you will not be depressed. Depression is also a reaction. Depression is a reaction to be downcast and low in spirit is a reaction to a storm and it's that force that comes against you to press down on you, to make you gloomy and to make life look dark and gloomy and bleak. And you, you can be, sometimes it can even make you feel so inadequate to deal with life. But depression is a spirit from the pits of hell. 
because it is totally contrary to joy, which is the Lord's. So depression doesn't come from the Lord. So where can it come from? Amen. If the devil cannot steal your joy, he cannot take your goods either. You, want one, you know, if you think that life is one thing after another, go to the Word and read in Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, not with sadness. We know that there's times of sadness and grief. And we endure them for a season. But joy always comes after that. There must, as much as there, I, I declare this in the name of Jesus, as much as there will be a time limit on anger, there will be a time limit on depression, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And your people will be set free from the bondage of depression in the name of Jesus. And he will do that if he can, if he can, if he's the God of the impossible, whatever it is, oh, it's my brain chemicals, it's whatever. Well, he can change you right down to your molecular state. He can change you. If, if he can heal cancer and raise people from the dead, then he can change your body chemistry. I um, absolutely believe that. I have no doubt about that at all. Amen? Yes. Nehemiah 8.10, he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. So don't sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And we've got to cultivate the ability to express joy and laughter. And that's why I love that verse that says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Because sometimes you just have to make it happen. You know, sometimes... You just have to make it happen. My wife took a photo of me doing DIY, very unflattering one, and then showed it to me. And I thought, immediately I thought, I, what, how do I react here? And, I la and I, then we laughed. We laughed. We have to cultivate the ability to express joy and laughter. Don't be too, so conservative that you can't laugh. I think of a person like that when David returned, dancing and spinning after that victory, there was a certain woman that looked down onto him. Michal, don't know if I got the pronunciation right, and she had such disdain. How dare you? You make a fool of yourself by being so happy. But she lost everything. And what, what did he gain? Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll finish this. Five minutes. Weeping in distress, crying in the face of a storm. You know, we suffer deep mental and emotional anguish and sorrow and pain. And, you know, sometimes it's so much to bear that it takes us even beyond crying tears. It's a, almost a deep pain that you cannot even express the, the pain of it. You live in a silent agony, not even able to talk sometimes. But Psalm 30 verse 5 says, His anger is for a moment, but his favor is for life. So even though weeping will endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. But I know those seasons where it's so terrible that you can't even cry another tear. But God is with you in those times. He's with us. He'll see us through those things. Amen. Feeling isolated. If there's only one thing worse than being in a storm, it's being in a storm on your onesome lonesome. Amen. Be assured you don't need to go through your storm alone. Sometimes you will weather it yourself, but others are also going through storms. Maybe they've experienced what you exp are experiencing. All right. And that's why I mentioned last week about being genuine with your testimony. You know, if, if you say, say, speak to someone and every single time they say, you know, how are you doing? Top of the world. I'm on top of the world. I'm on top of the world today. And they're always on top of the world. Sometimes we just need to be tr so a bit more truthful. You know, I'm slightly weary of that person who's always on top of the world. Okay, top of the world. Because the reality is, not, not every day is a mountaintop day. 
Some days are, are valleys. And some days is peat bog right up to waste. You even sunk lower than the valley. You're in the peat bog. Amen. And so don't feel isolated. John 15, 5 says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So don't be without Jesus. Don't be without him. You can't do anything without him anyway. Amen. Hebrews 13, 5, let's remind ourselves, it says, the God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Matthew 28, 20, teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we can overcome isolation by realizing that we need each other. And I want to encourage you to be part of the team. Be part of the team. Be part of the team. Amen. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. A, a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. You'll find that in Ecclesiastes 4. Amen. The one may be overpowered by another. Two can withstand him. I'm so thankful for covenant partners, especially my wife. She's the number one. No, God is my number one covenant, covenant partner. Then my wife. Because we can get through things when we're in covenant together. Amen? We can get through. The last one is fear. Reaction of fear. Fear makes us irrational. Fear causes us to panic and to do and say things that we will regret. Hallelujah. But God says that I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, according to 2 Timothy verse 1. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Amen. And so you've got a bit of reading to do in Job and a bit of reading to do now in 1 Samuel 30. Read the story about David and his mighty men who returned back to camp and all of their wives and children and stuff had been taken by the Amalekites and they'd fled. You'll see a lot of reactions in that passage of Scripture. That's what a good one to go to for how to react to a terrible, terrible thing. His men wept. He wept. They were greatly distressed. They were grieved. All reactions. But David strengthened and encouraged himself in the Lord. And he turned the situation round by seeking God's counsel. And they pursued, overtook, and recovered all. So I want to just say, end by saying, at the end of the storm, church, things will look better than they did before. Yeah. Have faith. Yeah. Don't lose your faith. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.